You've got questions. We've got answers. We have the man to answer them. Jeffrey Levine from Buckingham Wealth Partners. Jeffrey, welcome back to another episode of Ask the Hammer. Good to be with you, Bob. Good to have you. I've got a question in queue. It goes like this. I'm in my 20s and people say I need to have some estate planning documents in place. What should I have besides a healthcare proxy and a durable power of attorney? I read too that I need to worry about my digital assets. Excellent. Well, the fact that you're reading up and, and know that you have to worry about your digital assets, that is a, a, a fantastic start. And with respect to estate planning, there are generally five things we want to make sure we're addressing or five documents, potentially four, depending upon uh, whether two of them can be consolidated. The will, the power of attorney, the healthcare proxy, sometimes called the healthcare power of attorney. Uh, and with that, a, a HIPAA release sometimes can be a separate document, sometimes collectively with the healthcare proxy. And then finally, the living will. Those are kind of the five key estate planning documents that uh, virtually everyone should have. And when we're looking at these documents, kind of what do they do? Well, they can certainly address, so they can certainly address your digital assets. We just have to make sure that it's actually done. So for instance, a lot of people today have a will, that will may not address digital assets, especially if it hasn't been updated in recent years to account for laws such as uh, RUFADA, the Revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act. It's a mouthful, um, but it's a uh, the the law that really governs how digital assets are uh, are handled. In about 46, 47 states now have adopted this, so it, it, it's the it's the law of the land in most states. That being said, let's talk about each of these documents. The will, well, that creates uh, control and dictates how things will, will be handled upon your passing. So you wanna have an executor named in this will. If you have somebody who you want to be your executor, but maybe someone else to handle your digital assets, you can name a special executor or a special fiduciary in your will just for those digital assets. But again, that will is gonna dictate what happens when you're not here. If we move on to the power of attorney, general power of attorney is going to be for things like financial decisions, accessing accounts, paying bills, et cetera. And there are various types of powers of attorney. For instance, there's something called a durable power of attorney. That durable power of attorney is one that's in effect now and, if, and essentially remains in effect until you revoke it. That's why it's given the name durable. It, it, it will last, it's durable. By contrast, some people don't prefer to do that. They don't wanna turn over, let's say, financial control or the ability to access accounts or pay bills until a, a specific event occurs. So for instance, a, a power of attorney might say, I give person X control over these things, but only if I'm incompetent to do so myself. Well, that might give you the comfort of knowing that this person doesn't have access until you want them to, but it also can delay things at the time. For instance, maybe a, uh, you know, maybe a particular investment custodian says, hey, you need to have a judge tell us that you're incompetent uh, when the time comes. Otherwise, we're not going to accept this power of attorney. So there, there are some things to consider there. Uh, but again, that would handle your financial assets. And once again, if we're looking at digital assets, you can have that can handled by your general power of attorney, or you could name a special digital fiduciary to handle that for you. When we look at the healthcare proxy, this is effectively your power of attorney, but instead of for financial issues, for healthcare issues, who's going to make the decision as to you know, what measures will be taken uh, to, to help save your life or potentially in a, in a worst case scenario, you know, how it should be ended, what, what uh, you know, what action should be taken in order to, to end that life in the way that you would like if it, uh, you know, if it requires artificial means of support and so forth. Along with that, that healthcare proxy, sometimes it's written into it saying like, hey, this person can also access my, my HIPAA records. If not there, you want to make sure you have a document that explicitly authorizes someone to access your medical records. Uh, and, and even if you're married, it's important to have this for your spouse, because if there's not something on, in writing that says, hey, my spouse can access this information on my behalf, 
then they shouldn't be able to access it. You know, imagine a, a car accident and you get the call from the hospital as one spouse saying like, hey, uh, we've, we've, we've got your spouse here. They need a blood transfusion. They're, they're not going to make it unless they get one. We need to know their blood type immediately. And you get the call. You don't, I don't know. Let me call the doctor right away. Well, you call the doctor. If there's no HIPAA release on file, that doctor should not be releasing that information to you, even if it's, you know, of, of life and death urgency. So you want to make sure you have that on file. And finally, then the, the living will, which is essentially the instructions uh, to the individual who has that healthcare proxy. Like, these are the things I want. If uh, I don't want to be resuscitated, I don't want to be, um, you know, I don't want to have a feeding tube. I don't want to be, you know, kept alive on artificial, like, or I do, I do want to be, uh, have these things, or I, I do want to be a organ donor, you know, all of these types of uh, things addressed in the living will so that it's clear what you want. And, and I would say, you know, while a living will is important for you, it's even more important for others. You know, the, these end of life decisions uh, or, or just situations when someone is particularly ill, there's enough stress already. It's even worse to, to be guessing and, and second guessing yourself saying, gee, is this what this person would have, you know, is this what they would have really wanted? Or you know, maybe, I, maybe, maybe they did want to be kept on life support. Maybe they did. Like how, how stressful of a situation that is for someone when they're guessing at what you want. So, you know, if you're, if you're kind of on the fence, like, well, do I really need this? I don't know if I like, I'm not gonna, like, don't do it for you. Do it for the people you love and you care about so that if, and ultimately when the time comes that these things are needed, they're not guessing, they know what you want. Yeah. So obviously for someone in their twenties, this is part of adulting. I've got, I guess I, I've got two questions. One is some of these young adults own websites or URLs. I would take it that those are part of their digital assets that need to be accounted for. So at least someone owns them should someone um, prematurely die. Yeah, absolutely. You know, digital assets are include things that have financial value, but also things that don't. So, you know, when a lot of times when people think digital assets, the only thing they think about is like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, et cetera. But sure, it extends to digital marketplaces and websites, et cetera. But even beyond that, digital assets include things like your email account. You know, uh, think about what happened years ago when someone would be ill or, or even worse, they would pass away. The person in charge of, of, you know, they've put in charge of their financial affairs would probably go into their house, walk into their office or wherever it was, open the drawer, pull out the filing cat and start looking through and say, oh, they have a, uh, an AT&T bill. They have a Verizon bill. I don't know why they have both, but they have both of those, you know, like let's, let's start to, you know, they have their electric bill. Well, today, so many of us get that online, right? Like we don't have physical documents anymore? How do I know what things you have? How do I know if you have a Netflix subscription or, or, or so forth, if I'm your fiduciary? Well, the way you might know that is by accessing the person's email and seeing what comes in the same way mailed statements used to come in. You'd look and see, oh, hey, they have a, you know, so expressly authorizing your digital, your fiduciary to have access to, to digital assets, even like your email or social media accounts. Uh, these are things that are also digital assets. They may not have this like a direct monetary value, but they are still assets that are controlled uh, largely again by that law I mentioned, RUFADA, the Revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act. Once right. again, a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it is a mouthful. So uh, one more mouthful of question is, I know oftentimes parents of uh, children in their 20s um, may forget that they need to have a HIPAA on that child because maybe when they were under 18, they could speak to the doctor because the child was a minor. Yep. But now that the child is uh, of, uh, of majority age, uh, that goes away, right? If, if, a, if a child in their 20s was to be in an accident, the emergency room would not be able to talk to them without a, the parent without a HIPAA. That, that's exactly correct. Yep. And I'm not going to say that people don't sometimes slip up and, and say things when they're not supposed to, but they're not supposed to. You don't want to leave it to chance. You don't want to leave it to someone who actually is following the rules and then yell at them for following the rules, right? Like you want to make sure that these things, the, the, we're, we're talking about the worst possible situations in life. The last thing you want is it to be complicated by, in, in a way that can be easily mitigated. I, I know it's not fun to talk about these things. It's, it's not fun for any of us. And the likelihood is that you won't need them, at least for the foreseeable future. 
But the cost of being wrong is so great that it's worth the minimal amount of time. And generally, if you're a young person, you don't really have that. It's also a minimal cost to getting these things done. You want to take care of this while you can. And it becomes exponentially more important as your life becomes more complicated. For instance, when you get married, it's exponentially more important. Or if you get married, it's exponentially more important than it was when you were by yourself. You have children, <laughs> exponentially more important than it was before you had children, et cetera. It just keeps getting more and more complicated and more complex. But that's not to say that it's not important early on. It just goes from being really important to being really, 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 really important as things you know, continue to get more complex in your life. All right. Well, that's a really, really, really good answer. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. If you'd like us to, to, to take a shot at giving your question a really, 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 maybe a really, 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 really good answer, uh, then you can let us know and email us at askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. Again, that's askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. Bob and I look forward to answering your questions well, really, really well, real soon. <laughs>